I want to know why murder and mayhem are suddenly footnotes on a balance sheet. Look, all you need to know is that you're just along for the ride. Welcome to the Rest of the Orbis channel, and today we're going to continue our exploration of the Twin Cities in Minnesota by going to Minneapolis, or the City of the Lakes, as it, as it is known. And we can see that it looks like our classic city layout, where we have many old world buildings that have been surrounded by lovely postmodern structures to conceal them, such as the Fauché building that we're flying over right now. We can also see some other Art Deco buildings that seem to be concealed, and I can't help but think of Rochester. We begin by looking at the bird's eye view of Minneapolis. And it's interesting to note that this is probably one of the most comprehensive bird's eye view maps that we have. This was composed in 1891, supposedly. And here we see that the population is over 200,000. 22 mills grind over 10 million barrels of flour per year. 300 million feet of lumber sawed per year. So very impressive output for what's a relatively new city. And we'll look at its very rapid population growth here in a moment. But here we can see the mill district off the mighty Mississippi River. And we can also see a very well-developed bridge. So it seems to have quite some impressive infrastructure for a new city. And right over here we'll look that it's documented on the bird's eye view with the population 1865, 8,000 to 1892, going up to 200,000. Less than 30 years. Kind of reminds me of the staggering growth of Atlanta after the Civil War. But this is Minneapolis in Minnesota. And here's the mill district. And we can see how this is impressively depicted. Now remember, this is a bird's eye view, so this doesn't necessarily prove anything, but this gives us an idea. Here we can see what they call the new city hall, and we'll be taking a look at this later as it's still the current city hall. We also see some other very impressive edifices that are erected in this city, and many different variances in structures. Isn't it intriguing to consider the fact that this is a new city? And again, we're talking staggering growth in under 30 years. Impressive, and why would all these immigrants want to come here to the frozen land of the north, at least in relative terms? Interesting structure here, especially with the courtyard. I think the most intriguing aspect about this bird's eye view is we see more detail and more development. And is this even including the entire city as it was at that time? Well, if the population numbers are to be believed, no. And yet we see many different impressive structures. I mean, this really reminds me of looking at that panoramic photo of San Francisco in the 1870s. Just as unprecedented and yet so many established structures. Look at all these spires and towers over here on this part of town. Did they really need this many churches all over here? Was this the church district, as it were? They didn't have red light districts back then. They had church districts. It's the 1890s. What do you expect? I mean, how far back does it really go? Is this just more of what they would consider the common housing? Or are these the less well-endowed houses that they managed to inherit as they settled the city? Not that I'm implying that we didn't actually build this city, but it doesn't look like we actually built the city in that timeline. Here's how Minneapolis lays out in comparison with St. Paul. And you might recall last week's exploration of St. Paul, the capital of Minnesota, but Minneapolis is considered the most well-known of the Twin Cities. Okay, and I don't mean that to insult any of the residents of St. Paul. I mean, they're called the Twin Cities. Looking at the panoramic view, though, we can see that many of the edifices and structures match what we saw in the bird's eye view. So at least we have more clues that that kind of infrastructure and those sort of buildings did actually exist in the very early days of Minneapolis. Many impressive structures, though, with fine construction and requiring quite a logistical footprint that we would think would be beyond the capabilities, at least in our traditional understanding of what the 19th century was. And Minneapolis does have a very proud history, and we looked earlier on the bird's eye view map, and they already documented the mill history, and here we have the Pillsbury Flour Mill. And these mills are very intriguing as well, and you have to ask the question, are these mills, the existing infrastructure, what really drew all the people to come to Minneapolis over time? I mean, that's a lot of people. This is a view of the construction of I-35, south looking north, and we can see one of the structures, the Midtown Exchange, off to the right we'll be looking at later. There are many fine churches, and even though we saw so many in the bird's eye view, there's still a few that survive that do give us an indication that there were all these impressive steeples and towers. And yet at the same time, we can see some impressive architecture. 
Ah, uh, yes, Cass Gilbert. Another one of these architecture extraordinaires, or architect extraordinaires, capable of many wondrous feats in designing so many different buildings all within a lifetime. This is considered one of the first bridges that went across the river, and isn't this an impressive and unique structure? Not exactly the kind of bridge we'd expect to see, and of course we'll be told, well, this was the best they could do at the time in the 19th century. And yet, other odd-looking structures in what's supposed to be the mill district here. And why is it that this looks like this has been around for such a long time? This gives me a reminder of looking at the Niagara Falls area and all the power plants that were there. And we have many other structures, whether they be breweries or mills or whatever else, that are very impressive and seem to have a more impressive architectural styling and capability behind them. Also consider the logistics in bringing in all those blocks. And yet, everywhere you look within the mill district, mill district or wherever in Minneapolis, you see the signs of these impressive structures with many of their block construction. And again, what's this material? Well, of course, we'll be told it's stone that's been through the process of rustication, etc., etc., etc. And here we even have a museum piece of one of the original mills that you can still visit, the Mill City Museum. Impressive that they would preserve it to this extent although I'm still wondering what exactly was there. And here's a close-up of that mill district that we saw in the bird's eye view. And again, I'm extremely impressed with this bird's eye view with the different colors and depictions of all the structures. I think there's more detail in this particular bird's eye view than I've seen in any of the others. Well, let's start by looking at the Federal Reserve here. And of course, we have a very subtle structure here with many great columns and pillars integrated into the walls. And we can see that this matches what we consider the classic neoclassical or Greco-Roman design. Here's the interior. Yes, that's the kind of interior you need for your finest efforts of banking. And where would we be without the Federal Reserve? And of course, there is a well-known Federal location, Federal Reserve location in Minneapolis. Where else would it be? There's also been lots of labor disputes that Minneapolis has been known for over the years, especially in the 1930s. So we can see that there were some disruptions and difficulties in the city in the distant past, that it didn't conform to this expectation we have of essentially being a near social utopia in the past, as we're told. Here's the original Stonemason Bridge, and one of the first and only that went across the Mississippi at the time, and it stands to this day. We'll be taking a look in a subsequent exploration at the Mississippi and some of the infrastructure that's available on it. Ah, and I just wanted to contrast this with some of our modern architecture that we have in the wondrous city of Minneapolis. And here we can see these are the finest examples of what we can accomplish today. Yes, doesn't it just really give you the feeling of artistic inspiration and beauty when you gaze upon these structures? And you can see why a structure like this would really stand out. Now, if you live in a structure like this, I can understand why you feel the way you do when you go about your day-to-day -day life. I mean, imagine working in a structure like this. And if you actually work in the structure, hey, let me know about it in the comments. It's uh, very intriguing, and it's the example of what we can achieve today. But let's look at the Lumber Exchange Building, 1885. And don't you find it interesting that the Lumber Exchange Building is not actually made of lumber? Well, why would it be? I mean, of course, it needed to be made of stone so it would last. And you could actually affect a lumber exchange within such a structure that would hold up for a long period of time. And you might recall the very staggering figure that we looked at documented on the bird's eye view map that told us about the amount of lumber that was processed here. And of course, from a perspective of looking at things objectively, we would think that would make sense because Minnesota, known as the land of 10,000 lakes, although they'll tell you it's also 18,000 lakes. It depends who you're asking at the time. And naturally, there's many trees in northern Minnesota. So I suppose that makes sense. Looking on the inside of this structure, though, we can see that it's a lot of bricks. And again, you know, we didn't see anything documenting where they were making bricks, but maybe they just made them in St. Louis and then brought them up the river with all the paddle steamers that they had. I mean, that's not violating any sort of narrative considerations or account considerations that we have. But it is quite an impressive logistical achievement, if that is indeed what happened. Of course, you'll find many different accounts if you look into specific buildings in terms of where they got the blocks and the bricks all across Minnesota. Again, we see that arched entryway, and it's impressive that this building is still standing and probably looks exactly the same today as it did back in, well, at least the time we'd think of as the 1890s. Why does it seem like that exchange shine is just tacked on the front there? Impressive arch and then a couple columns on either side, and we've certainly seen those design cues before, and we've also seen all the different types of motifs. 
And yet, interesting how in the different light the stone seems to reflect the light differently, if that's indeed stone or whatever it actually is. This is an impressive structure, and again, the lumber exchange. Still standing to this day, and certainly not the kind of building that would actually be made out of lumber. Now, I'm really pondering, if we go off of the mainstream account, why would they need to build a structure like this for the lumber exchange? Why not just actually build an open forum that's only one story? Oh well. Let's take a look at the Paul Wellstone Federal Building, 1913. This was originally designed as a post office, and then it became a federal building in the 1930s. And Paul Wellstone was a famous senator from Minnesota. Now, during his time, he was considered a little bit more of a, uh, how should we say, left-leaning senator, although if he were around today, he'd probably be considered right-right centrist. You know how the scale seems to move over the years. But what an impressive structure here, another neoclassical structure, and we see some of the columns. And apparently this uh, structure was also used as a military entrance processing station during its history. And indeed, I had a close friend that uh, began his career in the military at this very building. Quite intriguing that they would use such an impressive building as a military entrance processing station, but he can verify it, and we have no reason to doubt it. We do see that the columns here are sectional, but wondrous decorations up towards the top. And you'd probably ask the question, well, why do we need to design such an ornate post office? Because we had to replace this dump. This was the original post office. And yes, I'll just spell it out for you. I'm being very sarcastic. This is not a dump. This is an incredible building. This is not a building we could build today or will, would build today for any kind of post office. But this was the original post office in Minneapolis. And you can see it's next to another impressive building, which looks to be exactly like that building we saw that was documented in the bird's eye view indicating that it did exist. At least we have clues that it existed, but remember an image doesn't necessarily prove anything definitively. It provides clues. Very impressive columns though, and even the arches and the window ways. And you can see why this would be a structure that'll endure for all time. And I have a feeling they could use this as a military entrance processing station for the next 1,000 years. Here's an image of Paul Wellstone, and he unfortunately met a tragic end in a plane crash in 2002, if memory serves. And apparently he was a very influential political figure at the time and was known for touring in a green bus. He also appeared in the movie Cave Dwellers, reviewed by Mystery Science Theater 3000, which coincidentally also started in Minneapolis. Yeah, it does kind of look like Paul Wellstone, doesn't it? <laughs> but in any event, uh, he was known for uh, touring around in a green bus. Looking at the interior of the Paul Wellstone Federal Building, we can see that it's no less impressive with its columns and pillars and what exactly is it made out of? Is it marble or is it some other form of marble? Or are we going to find out that there's 50 different types of marble? Yes, military entrance processing station. You can see why you need that decoration within the roof and all those columns. And those are the kind of things that you need to run an effective post office too, especially with those impressive elevators. 1913. And looking a little bit more closely at these interior columns, again, we can see that they're putting all this attention and all this effort for the interior decoration. And I think this is where we see that there is something that's much more unique reflected within this building. Even with this pediment over this door. And you can see all the way from the floor to the walls up to the ceiling as far as we can see that, again, no detail is spared. And so this definitely has the coherence with our classical building. Here's the Minneapolis City Hall, built 1888 to 1909. So they do give us a little bit more of a realistic construction timeline behind this very impressive edifice. And we've certainly seen this design styling before. In many other cities, this would probably be considered a Union Station. Well, here in Minneapolis, it's a City Hall. So is that to say that the architect styling or the architect design for this type of building had one purpose? Or would it make more sense if this was a building type that was founded, if you follow me, and then it was purposed accordingly by those who decided to use it for whatever purposes that they had in mind, depending on what city they were in and what the need was at the time. I don't know. I mean, if this was an existing design type, you would think that it would only be for one purpose of building. We're told that that roof is made out of copper now, and it's still a very impressive castle. And for some reason, it really reminds me of the Union Station that we looked at, both uh, on the ground and in an original exploration in St. Louis. Ah, it looks like here we have a statue of Neptune within this building. Of course, they won't tell us that it's actually Neptune. They've got some other name for it, or Neptune, or Poseidon, or whatever name you want to go with. Or we can just say that, yes, this is the symbol of Minnesota and the harvest that we had. What about all the milling efforts that they were known for? How about a lumberjack of some sort? No, this has a very sea motif towards it. 
Very impressive structure, though, regardless of which perspective you look at it. And, of course, we know it's a true old world building because it's a wedding venue. I think that's always qualification number one. Is it a wedding venue? And if people are actually getting married within it, then you know that it is a true old world building. City Hall and Hennepin County Courthouse. Minneapolis, Minnesota. And so we can see in this postcard and all these other images that we've seen that this has always been an impressive structure. The other thing I find intriguing is that they say it took over 20 years to build, and yet that bird's eye view we had earlier showed it being complete. I guess they must have spent all that time maybe building the statue and then laying out the interior. I mean, that could have taken a lot of time. The exterior, that probably only would have took them, you know, 36 days, maybe. You know, something magical about the number 36 or 48, maybe 48 days. But in all the images that we see, it's always been an impressive structure, and we can see that even once the rest of the high-rises of Minneapolis rose around it, for some reason they just don't compare with the structure. Not on the exterior, and certainly not on the interior. These interior lights are quite intriguing as well. I haven't seen anything quite like this, except for the Animosa prison. Here's the original city hall, or so we're told, in this less than satisfactory image, but you know we can attribute that to the limitations of technology at the time, and of course transferring the image through many different forms of software. Don't need any roads around it. You can see there's just a nice little dirt road going around it, and maybe that's what we would expect. And yet, it still seems to be a very impressive structure, especially given the rapid development of Minneapolis. We'd expect maybe some sort of temporary wood structure, but no, those are never temporary. Uh, yes, it looks like it's laid out for the wedding venue, and you've got Poseidon, Neptune, or whichever uh, old Greek god you want to say it is, or I'm sorry, the god of harvest, or whatever they're going to call it today, watching over you during your wedding. And you can see that regardless of whether it's a color or a black and white photograph, it still conveys the impressive detail. And again, what exactly is the interior made out of? Sandstone, limestone, some sort of advanced concrete, geopolymer, take your pick. Let's go to the Rand Tower, 1929. And here we have another one of our fine Art Deco buildings. And since, since it's an Art Deco building, you know that it was built in a year, max of two years. And this is one of our classical Art Deco buildings that has many of the grand stylings. And of course, like many other unfortunate Art Deco buildings, it is surrounded by all these wondrous commercial towers of glass and steel that are very featureless. But yet this building still endures, and despite the fact that it might not be as tall as the other quote-unquote more modern buildings around it, it is still impressive nonetheless and still manages to hold its own in a variety of ways. This is an interesting photograph because it almost gives us the impression that the structure has been around a lot longer than we'd like to think or believe. And of course we see the Art Deco stylings and detailings that you can miss if you don't look a little bit more carefully. Now I guess we're going to say this is Mercury or this is Hermes or something else, you know, whatever in our pantheon of Greek gods that we'll say that we just decided to put up in all our Art Deco buildings. At least the Art Deco buildings that weren't Mayan or Aztec Revival or whatever other revival that we wanted to amalgamate with that style because, you know, Art Deco just wasn't enough on its own. Look at this here in the stairway. And this is certainly advanced in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. And I guarantee you this has never been renovated. Maybe it's been cleaned a few times over the years. But it's impressive that it's holding out this well. And even in the other portions of the structure where they've modernized it, we can still see the original Old World glory. Very impressive in the Rand Tower. And this is a hotel that you can still go stay in to this day. And this is an interesting figure. Now, is this something that they added later? Is this what we considered postmodern art? Or is this something that endured from the original structure shortly after its original construction, if you follow me? Not exactly sure, because it doesn't really reflect things we'd expect to see. And yet, here in this older image, we can see that the building looks already old and rather dirty. And if this is set in the 1930s or the early 1940s, it shouldn't be that old. Well, I guess that whole process of rustication again, or whatever you want to say. The interior, though, you can see it with the floors and the stairway. And the curved stairway, of course, is always impressive. The spiral stairway, which that's what it looks to be. And even in the doorway... And then looking at the front, we can see that we have that same kind of styling with the Art Deco buildings. A little bit of a polished granite, at least what will be told is polished granite at the very base. And then what appears to be some sort of concrete, and yet it's a concrete that's holding up very well to this day. So again, is it really concrete? Not sure. And here we have this very intriguing, angelic, almost demi-human figure that's watching over this entryway. 
Executive Club, I wonder what that's like. And here you can see more of the stylings that we've come to expect with the Art Deco structures, with the elevators and the way the floor is laid out. Interesting symbols too when you pay attention to those across these Art Deco buildings where we see many different examples. And of course they have the plaque on it so we know it's a Rand Tower Hotel, ooh, whiskey and soda, and the Rand Tower Club. I wonder if that's uh, actually up on the penthouse. I wonder really what is the foundation of this building exactly like and here we're looking down this impressive staircase and again we see the signs of a technology that we just are told that we have but we decide not to practice in this modern age because it's not economically viable there's safety standards in our usual array of reasons were given yes Hermes or whatever you want to say I'm not gonna say that it's something more advanced interesting how they have what appears to be planes but what exactly is going on there? And then another look at the elevators again in this entryway. And you can see why this would be purposed as a luxury hotel. And certainly it's safe to say that this exceeds many of the modern luxury hotels that we have now. And I'm not exactly sure what to make of the layout of this image. Is this figure really something that was established later? I mean, what will we be told? You can even see the detailing above both of the elevators. Now let's go to the Midtown Exchange, built 1928 and expanded to 1.2 million square feet. Yes, another lovely Art Deco building, and of course you know the construction timeline behind Art Deco buildings. They were built within a year to two years. And this Midtown Exchange is no exception, and quite intriguing that we're told that they had to expand it to 1.2 million square feet. In fact, this was the largest indoor area available in Minnesota until they constructed the Mega Mall in the 1990s. And you can see that this was definitely the mega mall of its day, if you will. A very large and impressive and imposing structure. And yet it has the central tower behind it, and it has the trappings of Art Deco, especially if we look down at the windows, and even the designs around the windows and the initial entry doors. And it's a very intriguing design that they would go with something like this, because this, again, reflects back to what we would see with old world compound designs, where we see very large buildings that would all tie together. And here we can see where the Midtown Exchange lines up in relation to the construction of I-35. And of course we recall the destruction or the collapse of the I-35 bridge. And isn't it intriguing how something that we know to be New World or Fifth Era architecture has infrastructure issues and yet the old bridges we never hear of collapsing. I'm sure that once again that's just another coincidence. Now, continuing to take a look at the Midtown Exchange, we can see that it has different appearances in different lighting schemes, and very intriguing in how the walls reflect, and you can still see the old world beauty within this particular structure. And yet on the inside, we can tell that because of all these renovations and expansions over time, that much of the old world beauty is covered and concealed, and yet some of it you can still see if you look hard enough on the interior. So this is probably one of the great tragedies is that this particular Art Deco building has lost a lot of its interior old world beauty, especially when we consider the ornate details that we tend to see with many of the old world buildings and the Art Deco buildings especially. Yet in some areas of it, it seems to have retained some of the original Art Deco stylings on the inside, but I have to ask, what did this originally look like? And I couldn't exactly find any images of the interior, so if anybody has any images of this Midtown market during its glory days, the 1930s and the 1940s, especially of the interior, I would appreciate you letting me know in the comments, and I would be delighted to take a look at it with you. And share understanding in terms of what this structure really looked like because here on the exterior we can see some of the fine detailing that comes with Art Deco. Now there's a lot of people who find the entire fascination with Art Deco to be well absurd in that they believe that yes we could easily build any one of these buildings within a year time frame especially the ones with the very ornate interiors in the 1920s because it was the roaring 20s and things were possible because well we said they were possible. If it was really that possible to do something though in the 1920s, and here we can see it, Sears, Roebuck, and Retail Store, then why isn't it a capability that was expanded on after World War II? We're told that the Western powers won World War II and they had a great material supremacy. So why would they abandon this 
incredibly beautiful and artistically driven construction concept, both the interior and exterior buildings. And indeed, if you want to talk to someone about Art Deco, talk to somebody who is an artist and someone who studied to be an artist, and you'll find that many of them were aware of Art Deco. Let's go to the Lakewood Cemetery, 1908, and here in the main chapel we have the Hagia Sophia style that seems to be embraced and expressed here. Yes, of course, you're going to build a chapel in the cemetery after the Hagia Sophia. Why not the Mausoleum of Helicarnassus? I mean, we saw that all the time with some other structures. Look at the interior detailing on this dome on the inside. Very impressive and not at all what we'd expect to see for a relatively modest cemetery. And yet we can see that there are other wondrous structures that continue to make up this cemetery and some fine tombs. Now, I had a good discussion with a viewer on comments who was telling me about how we should be considering cemeteries and I certainly agree with that. Ah uh, yes, here we see more of our postmodern architecture within the cemetery. So you can see that even this particular cemetery has been beset by the wonders of postmodern architecture, or we'll just say modern architecture. And yes, that definitely gives me a comforting feeling. But then you look at something like this, the Fridley Monument, and you can see it right there on it. And again, you're given the impression of a much more old world feel with this, with the columns and the pillars and an arch and all the decorative detailing. And here's a close-up of the statue. So what exactly did this represent? Is this really a memorial to the Fridley family? Or is there something else? A very lifelike statue, almost in a disturbing fashion, and yet in a very beautiful fashion at the same time. We can see that some of these figures in this particular cemetery do reflect a more human quality, that they seem to capture it a lot more. Certainly more than that uh, lovely modern building that we just saw. And we can also see different elements of concrete or construction materials. And that was part of the conversation that I had with the viewer is it's easy to tell when the cemeteries are older when you have the old entry pillar stones because they seem to be of a higher quality material. Here we have the vault right here and you know, just constructed a marble and we have the very wonderfully decorated window with the different coloring of the glass, which is always an impressive feature and definitely an indicator that we have with the old world. We also have some of these uh, mausoleums here. We've got a pyramid, we've got a nice classic uh, neoclassical format with the columns and even some other obelisks. And here we have a nice and impressive obelisk that we're told is a monument to some unfortunate accident that occurred. Now, is that really the story behind these monuments, these gravestones, and these mausoleums, or is there more to it? And here we have the rock denoting Paul Wellstone's unfortunate passing in 2002. There was quite the investigation with the plane crash, and they determined that while it was not an intentional act, the pilots had some issues. Let's take a look at the Fauché Tower, 1929. Once again, another Art Deco building and a very unique Art Deco building. In fact, I've never quite seen an Art Deco building exactly like this. And even the Fauché name on it feels like it was added, as though somebody put some rather cheap lighting around it, and that's how they designated it. The story behind this structure is very fascinating, too, with the individual named Fauché being convicted of conducting a pyramid scheme in the late 20s and the 1930s. And in fact, uh, John Philip Sousa even composed a march for the opening of this building, and then when Fauché wrote him a check, the check bounced. Fortunately, President Roosevelt uh, commuted the sentence, and then he was pardoned overall, as usually seems to be the case. And we can see that with this very unique structure, it's also a compound, much like we saw with the Midtown Market. So it's not just simply a building, it's actually an entire compound. And here with this baseline structure. Very impressive, and we're told that architects to this day are still impressed by the design of this Fauché building. And we even see a hint of the old, what we're, what we're told is the Mausoleum of Helicarnassus top on this particular Art Deco building. And the other thing that's unique about it is just the way that the building slants, and then it joins up towards the top, along with the pyramid or mausoleum of Helicarnassus structure. Of course, who knows if that's what it really looked like, because official history tells us that the mausoleum of Helicarnassus has been gone for hundreds of years, so how would anybody have any idea what it looked like? And yet somehow we know, well, it's very well documented. Chroniclers at the time and artists at the time drew it very well, and that's how we know. But again, it's as though this building is a very large obelisk in and of itself. And yet, when you try to compare a model of the building to the real thing, you'll see that, as we have within every other case with old world buildings, the model does not compare with the current building at all. 
and the interior is completely and totally majestic with this particular Art Deco building. And here we have a fully preserved old world interior. And we're going to take a look and admire some of these interior photos because when we consider the Fauché building, the fact that it still stands to this day and the fact that they've surrounded it with modern glass and steel towers, and yet despite the fact that they're taller, there's just a way that they don't compare with this building. And I'm reminded of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where they've surrounded the Plumber Building there with postmodern buildings. And even here in the stairway, you can see the same sort of layout that gives you the impression of a much more advanced architectural styling and construction techniques that were available. And looking at finer images that detail the interior even better, we can see that all the wonderful qualifications of Art Deco are applied within this building, and they have not been renovated or removed over the years. Indeed, from the pattern on the floor to the walls to the ceiling, it gives us that impression of a building where you would go to to have your spiritual well-being reinvigorated, where you could feel your creative and imagination outlets fully expressed. And yet, we can see how this was originally a mainstay, a true landmark on the skyline of Minneapolis, that there was really no other structure that matched it. And even with the way they've surrounded it with all the lovely postmodern buildings, somehow they just don't compare. And here you can even see it in the design of these elevators where they have an emblem of the building itself. So I'm asking you viewers in the comments, what do you think this building originally represented? Because here in this diagram, which once again we have a limited perspective diagram, two perspectives, you know you don't need to see anything more than that, and just based on this drawing you could of course build the building yourself, right? <laughs> in any event, it's an impressive structure. And why does it look like an obelisk? And here we look at the very top of it and you can see that the lights that they installed on it feel, well, let's just say, I'm not going to say it was shoddily done, but it feels rather hastily concluded that they put the Fauché name on it, especially if this was the individual who provided the funding to build this very impressive edifice. And, no, nope, just put my name up there on the lights. I don't want it actually carved or engraved into the concrete or whatever material this building is truly constructed out of. You can even see that for the longest time this was the tallest building in Minneapolis until they put one of these wonderful modern buildings next to it. And yet, despite the fact that the modern building is much taller, it just doesn't match the majesty of the Fauché Tower. And you're certainly not going to see elevator doors like this with this kind of artistic detailing and the design of the building on it itself. Now I'm starting to ponder or speculate exactly what the original intention behind this building was. And again, I'm also curious about the foundation. Looking at older images, too, it also gives us the impression that the structure is much older than its establishment in the 1920s. I mean, think, this structure isn't even 100 years old, and yet we have the impression that it's been around a lot longer, and somehow it's managed to endure while retaining a lot of its interior beauty over this time. And I think this is one of the finest Art Deco buildings that we've seen. It certainly matches the Plumber Building, I dare say, in Rochester, Minnesota, which I think, until looking at this Fauché Tower, was one of my personal favorites. What are your personal favorite Art Deco buildings? Let me know in the comments. And do you have any Art Deco buildings that you'd like me to explore in subsequent explorations? Because I think, oddly enough, or perhaps fittingly enough, two of the most uh, beautiful Art Deco buildings are in Minnesota. The Fauché Tower here in Minneapolis and the Plumber Building in Rochester, Minnesota, as part of the Mayo Clinic. And we can see that the structure is held up very well over time. And we're even told that its foundation and its structure is so well built that it can stand up to 400 mile per hour winds. Of course, we're well aware of the Midwest propensity or unfortunate location as to where it's struck by tornadoes, even this far north. And yet this is a structure that we're told that can stand up to winds that are over hundreds of miles per hour. Very impressive. I wonder what else this structure could stand up to. And looking at more images of the interior, we can see that they've preserved that kind of beauty. Now, of course, John Philip Sousa had to compose a march of welcome for the opening of this building. There's even a story about how they never played the march of welcome because the check bounced after that. And you can see here how the Fauché Tower is compared to the city gates in St. Augustine, Florida, another exploration we've done, and the Statue of Liberty in New York City. Yes, there will be an upcoming exploration on the Statue of Liberty. That's an interesting story in and of itself. I'm still impressed by these symbols or images we have of the Fauché Tower on the elevator doors. And I think, again, that reflects the obelisk nature of this building. And I think that's why this is such a unique building. 
I mean, if you think about it as its own, this is one of the very largest standing obelisks that we've seen. If anyone knows of any taller or more grandiose obelisks, whether it's a building or an actual obelisk, please let me know in the comments. But I'm impressed by the coloring of this building. And even looking at the older photos where we see the black and white, we can see just how intriguingly impressive the layout of this interior is. And what is this? Is this marble? Is this granite? Is this some sort of combination? Well, let's go to the Basilica of St. Mary, built 1907 to 1914. You might recall we looked at the Cathedral of St. Paul, which is right next door to Minneapolis. And of course, Minneapolis has to have their own very impressive church, although this is a full-fledged basilica. Now, was this really constructed 1907 to 1914? Keep in mind that over in St. Paul from 1906 to 1915, they were building the Cathedral of St. Paul. So I guess this booming nature of both Minneapolis and St. Paul, they both had to have very impressive churches. And indeed, these are the most impressive churches, and they compare with the very finest that we've explored when we've gone over to Europe. Look at that central window that we believe or speculate is associated with cymatics and yet some of the interiors of this basilica are impressive beyond the ability of words to describe look at the little dome there with all the impressions and all the geometrically precise symbols now of course we'll be told that once again this is merely the result of religious piety and everyone was very religious in the early 20th century and certainly in the 19th century and that's why they would dedicate the effort and the resources required to construct a building like this. Of course it's not made of lumber even though we were told on the bird's eye view map that there was a vast abundance of lumber available in this part of Minnesota. But was there a vast abundance of limestone or sandstone available? Well, we know one of the nearest quarries is actually down right next to Rochester, the Manterville deposit. Look at the impression of this window and all the coloring and the way this factors together. This is just something that I can see why it would inspire a divine feeling in many people when they saw this or walked within this edifice. This truly is worthy of the title of Basilica. It's worthy of the title of Cathedral. Frankly, it's worthy of the title of one of the most beautiful buildings you've seen. And you can see why it compares with many of the elaborate churches, cathedrals, or basilicas that we've seen in Europe. It's laid out in the same way, and if we didn't know any better, we wouldn't think we were in Minneapolis. Perhaps we'd think we were in Vienna or somewhere in Germany, or who knows wherever else. Now, wouldn't it be intriguing to actually see a full documentation of photos from start to finish, and certainly better than the ones that we saw of the Cathedral of St. Paul over in St. Paul? And yes, of course, it's a wedding venue, as if you needed to know that. I'm sure you could guess that. Look at the ceiling, though, and just how detailed and precise the layout of the construction is here. And I think this is, after all the structures that I've seen and all the churches and cathedrals we've seen, this is one of the most impressive. And we did just look at the Cathedral of St. Paul. And here we are in Minneapolis, right next door, at least to cities go, and yet another very impressive basilica or cathedral, or whatever you want to call it. And look at the central altar there, as though it's not enough that there's a dome on top of it, they had to have a dome on the inside as well. And you can see why they would consider this a minor basilica, and we've seen many of those symbols before. And interestingly enough, this structure sits right off the main interstate. Ah yes, and we've talked about in other explorations how interstates seem to facilitate the rapid bypassing of impressive structures. I find it interesting as well how the interstate allows you to speed right on by this basilica and over in St. Paul, the Cathedral of St. Paul. Blink and you'll miss it because you're focused on the interstate and somebody cutting you off and you're not going to look to your left or look to your right and you'll see the most impressive churches that you've ever seen in your life. And I would dare say that looking at the images of this particular basilica, that this matches the most impressive structure that you've ever seen in your life when it comes to a church or a cathedral. Minneapolis and St. Paul, and they did this at the start of the 20th century. Look at the layout and the interior of this building. Look at all the glass, look at all the arches, all the pillars, and you have some of the most beautiful detailing that we've ever seen. Of course, people have to obstruct these explorations. They have to do anything they can to disrupt them. Because once you start looking, you can't stop looking. And once you start seeing the elevation of beauty and design, you can really glean the once great divine purposes behind all of these structures in their original layout. And Minneapolis is no exception. And once again, we have another fine and well-detailed organ. Well, I hope you enjoyed this exploration. We'll close it by looking at what's supposed to be a symbol of this basilica. 
with an umbrella on it, and yet a moon symbol, a crescent moon symbol? What are your thoughts on this? Well, thanks for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe.